One, two, three, four. Hello everyone and welcome to the Power of Music Thinking. My name is Christoph Zürn and this is the podcast for people with a musical heart and a wicked job. We're looking for stories, insights and tools from the big world of music to inspire leaders and followers to listen, tune, play and perform in whatever field you're operating. Nowadays, composers no longer work only for the concert hall or the opera stage. Today, a composer who creates the next symphonic work has become an innovator who can be active in a wide range of fields, from video to film, from sonic branding to sound identity of products and services. Today, we speak with Mike von der Namer, a sound researcher, music therapist, scientific collaborator at the German Aerospace Center and composer. With over 30 stage works and 100 compositions, he holds international recognition. He has collaborated with Grammy, Kenwood, Sony BMG, Rolls-Royce and BMW. And his music has been featured in TV series like Nova. As an artist in residence at the SETI Institute in New York, Mike is engaged in innovative projects that offer fresh perspectives and push the boundaries of music and sound design. So here Mike shares with us some sonification projects in various domains, such as weather patterns, language, the brain, and sound design in autonomous vehicles. For example, he gives us insights into his work at the German Aerospace Center, where he works on the sonification of air traffic control. So to, today you will not only hear us talking, but also experience different sound worlds, because Mike brought some sound files to the conversation. So we hear different sound layers from an air traffic game and examples of what he calls mood compositions for Rolls-Royce, BMW and Mini that are central in the sound strategy of these car brands. And we end the conversation with a longer piece of about five minutes of sonification of curves that Mike co-created with two outstanding mathematicians in Luxembourg. So be prepared to hear about pioneering thoughts connecting sound, science and human experience. Hello, Michael. Welcome to The Power of Music Thinking. Hi, I'm very happy to be here and spend this time and explore some music and sound with you. Thank you. Looking forward to it. My first question, my ritualistic question, what was your first sonic experience or record or live performance that had an impact on you? Well, there's this this uh, classical case that I have always explored with my mother, which was literally, I think, in the womb. And there is the story that my mother was listening a lot to Chopin and to some other classical composers like Wagner. Um, and I think that had a huge impact because when I was in eighth grade, we were listening to the Chopin E minor uh, piano concerto and I was running home to my mother and taking the bus as fast as I could. And I said to my mother, today I have listened to the greatest piece of music that I've ever heard. And she was uh, smiling, just asked, what kind of piece was that? And I said, well, this was this kind of classical composer and we listened to this piano piece and it was just like I was blown away and she was, was smiling. She said, well, uh, when you're in my womb, um, I was listening to the piece many, many times. And so there is even music therapy. There's the idea that what you kind of have um, as a listener while you're still in your mother's womb will have some kind of impact on you through your life. And so if you ask me this question, this would be my answer. Wow. Which one was it? It was Chopin? It was a solo uh -huh. piece? No, it was the, the E minor piano concerto. Ah, okay. Yeah. Oh. Back back then, I still didn't understand the connection between the, the orchestra part and the, the piano part. And um, I mean, some people might not like my answer for that, but I, I always ask her then, so why did he have to have this orchestra? The piano parts are so much bigger and greater um, because, as you know, some of the orchestration of the piano concerto, you can 
wonder about the the reason for them and really in the moment when the piano comes in it's really that there's something just happening with you and um so, and then she just said i don't know it's a piano concerto so there has to be an orchestra um but yes this this was always my 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 funny moment and then i think when when i was a little older so around six years old uh, she took me to the opera and I was listening to Hansel and Gretel. Mm. And and that really, to be honest, had a huge impact on me. I, I was obsessed about the piece. Um, it was something that even today when I'm listening to Hansel and Gretel, I always find something new in the orchestration and the mm. way it's just constructed. And um, I never liked so much the beginning of the opera. I always felt it was too happy. Um, maybe that's my weird way of, of being. Um, but like the second act with all of the things where they're happening in the woods and then the, the witch and how she is singing and uh, it, it was just blowing away. And then of course, in the very end of the piece, as you know, when when the, the children are freed, the, the marvelous uh, child choir of singing, oh, now we are freed. Even just talking makes me very emotional. So that I think was another huge, huge moment for me too. Oh, and inspired uh, Humperdinck. I think yeah. it's also in, in our family we 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 talked about it. It's uh, I think it's abends when ich schlafen gehe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thousand England um ich stehen or so yeah. um, when I go to bed at night, a thousand angels. Uh, so so there's also as a kid, if you hear this, that's yeah. Uh, um, yeah a lot of imagination besides the 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 music itself. Yeah, and I think I mean the the piece that you're talking about is kind of the 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 middle part of the opera. So when they really they they kind of afraid and and they 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 don't know what's going to happen, and then this is just an am amazing moment. Yeah, when they kind of uh, crunching together the uh, two of them, and then this this the yeah, the angels appear with this music, and I think it really had this even on me this calming effect. Yeah, that you really felt oh there's something that that is kind of securing your night dreams, and I mean how many kids have nightmares i'm just seeing this mm. from my daughter how many times is she waking up and and having some kind of nightmares and then you have to come out on her children and i always thought this is really it it helps it helps to calm you down and it, it gives you this idea of the angels yeah trying to to comfort you so yeah nice very nice um but in your answer there are two musical pieces um but because and and we we will hear in a, in a few seconds what you're really doing <laughs> for for the money um but the sound itself so maybe not necessarily music is there something that you say oh this was the first time that i re realized my my ears so like my my eyes i i uh, is there is there a moment of a sonic uh, experience uh, i think and that's another strange thing that um, I had as a child, I was um, obsessed, and I don't know why, um, of the sound of aircraft. Um, so where I was, uh, I was born in Munich, and there was close by um, yeah, the, the terminals, and you could still hear the, the aircrafts uh, sometimes going. And for some reason, and I, I don't have this anymore now when I hear them, um, I talked to someone that the, 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 the kind of... Um, stuff that makes your craft fly um, changed over time. But back then, this was a sonic experience where I always felt it was kind of bubbling me into um, a nice growling thing. And I I can't really explain this to you, and maybe this is just weird, but that was um, something where I realized there is this outer sound that is doing something with me. It was like, like a nice shiver, like I was inside the sound. And maybe again, that, that kind of reminded myself in, in the womb. I mean, as you know, it was very, very loud when, when we are in the womb, around 120 decibel. And so we really exploited and ex, um, yeah, like explosions of sounds are coming on us um, and there's bubbling and other things. And so maybe there's something that resonated with me as well. And then over the time, I really had everything around me that I was uh, interested in. It was even the sound of nature, but then I also had an Indian instrument of my father, which I was playing around. Um, I was exploring all kinds of other sounds. My mother was a sound engineer, so she constantly showed me stuff. She played me different things. She um, brought me to the uh, TV stations, showed me how she's working as a sound engineer, um, how she is mixing things together. Um, so I think that's really what I found interesting. But I think from my ear, um, the thing that really triggers me is orchestral music. And then from that, everything else comes. 
So that is really how I always felt. Mm, nice. So, but, but let's say, I would say the colored drone of different uh, aircrafts is also, let's say, in some kind of symphonic experience. So less with music, but but for sure with sound. It's like uh, sound bathing, but in a, in a totally different way. Absolutely, absolutely. And I mean, if if you think about it again, it's 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 something happening there that is is like you said, an orchestral sound. And some of my favorite sounds is really the 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 tuning of an orchestra, which again, in some weird way, is is very similar to to the experiences. And I always said, even when I was young, I said what I like most about music is to have the sound bath and to have this feeling that you're surrounded by music in some form. And I think that is also why in many compositions I, I explored these ideas of what could it mean you being inside the sound. Right, right. It's um, um, You also say uh, music is like touching from a, dif uh, mm -hmm. from, from a distance. So that's mm -hmm. that's very close. Okay, so maybe you can share with us what you're doing, what you do for a living, and then um, this explains a lot of where, why we dive so deeply into <laughs> sounds from aircrafts and also orchestra. Yes, so, so I mean, foremost, I've been working for many, many years now as, as a composer for concerts, for film music, for musical theater, opera. So I've really been spending my well, my, my broadest time in my life um, as, as a composer for that working worldwide between New York, Los Angeles, but we also had things all around the world. And then in 2010, uh, I was asked to work for BMW as well. And that was a kind of shifting moment for me uh, when I was developing new sound marks um, and sound design for the for the future of electronic cars. And since then, I have been really in between kind of strange two worlds in between the world of science and music. And so I was writing an opera and then I was doing something for BMW and then I was writing something else and working with other scientists. Yeah, and now I ended up, as you know, at the John Aerospace Center where I researched the sonification in air traffic control, which is uh, something that you probably, most of the, the listeners probably have no idea what the hell I'm talking about. The, the basic idea that you can imagine is that I'm trying to create... Um, Yeah, a lifetime or a, um, a living soundtrack for the movement of aircraft in space. Um, and the idea is that this would help um, in the future air traffic controllers to get an, 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 another idea of the whole picture of what's going on in the different sectors and where they are working on. Because at the moment, um, as you know, probably from, from all around the world, everything is going to be automized. Yeah, So we have ships that are driving themselves, we have cars driving themselves, uh, we have aircraft in the future that will drive themselves. Um, but we still need... Uh, for a long period operators in, in all kinds of different situations and places. And for that, it's very helpful for them to have not just the visual information because the more complex things also get, the more screens you have. And so you might have five, 10, or even more screens on top of each other or in a complex setting. And so there it's very, very helpful to have some kind of acoustic information that helps you to stay in the loop or get back to something that is important or have an additional information that can help you through the process of dealing with all of these informations. Maybe good to to just pick out this and la later we cycle back to your work at uh, BMW and your compositions. Um, but talking about aerospace, um, do these operators did they ask for for let's say sonic assistance <laughs> or how, how, how do you get a job like this yeah it was a very interesting thing so the the joint aerospace center just had this this job that said we need someone to to do sonification in air traffic control and so the joint aerospace center um maybe most of you don't know it it's but it's basically the joint equivalent of of nasa so they're doing all the kind of the kind of same or similar research that nasa is doing um and so they were interested in in thinking about this in different ways and different forms and so it was less the air traffic controllers and rather the engineers and programmers and people that actually develop the tools the programs all of the different hardware and software that you would need for for the future of air traffic control And so they had this call and I just applied and said, well, I'm not an engineer. I'm also not a programmer, but I do know a lot about sound and, and how sound can affect people. And that's 
how I got the position. And yeah, at the moment, I'm really the only composer working in that field there and exploring how sound, sonification, and even film scoring and how I call it soundtracking can help to to yeah to to deal with the information in a different way. Wow. You know, t talking about the, um, um, the the operators, I, I really can imagine that when they do their job, they would rather say, give me an, another screen, <laughs> maybe the seventh or the eighth, <laughs> and they don't don't ask you for sound. It's a little bit like um, when Henry Ford would have asked his clients, mm -hmm. they would say, give me quicker horses. And uh, now everybody's driving in a car. So uh, how... How is it there? How how open are they? Or is this um, a question asked too early because it's also just the research? No, it's a very good question. And I will be very honest, it's it's both sides. So I have air traffic controller that basically say, Mike, I don't need sound. It's actually quite the opposite um, because you have to imagine that at the moment when they work in these towers, they are, they are used to working in an environment where you have like 30 to 40 air traffic controllers. And they're basically always in two teams and they also need to listen to each other. But they basically um, need to have a very, very quiet environment to really focus on what they are doing. And so that's, I think, where they're really tuned in. So they, they're trying even to get rid of any kind of sound that, that could take their attention away. So they only have what they're hearing at the moment is each other. Yeah. So when they talk to each other, another air traffic controller that might sit next to them, where they also need to hear maybe something is happening and going on in their sectors that they need to know, and the phone. Uh, for kind of emergency situation. And that's all the sounds that they have there. And that is the problem for me at the moment, um, really in, in the, the bigger sense of the world, um, that they so used to this environment that it's very, very difficult for some of them to imagine to actually have sounds. So I had air traffic controllers that said, oh, this is a great idea. And I had air traffic controllers that said, We don't need this mic. We at the moment it is perfect as it is, and the problem for me is um, again that what we're trying to research there is actually not the current environment. So we're trying to do research that will be maybe um, available in like 15 to 20 years, and this is very very tricky for them to see that scenario. Even if I explain it, or even if my team explains, this could be the scenario in the future. It's still difficult for them to see that this might be completely different, that they basically, like you and me, we sit in our room, have our screen in front of us, and that's it. Yeah, then maybe there are speakers, maybe there's uh, three, four screens that they have in front of them, but they don't have any other people that they talk to. Um, even the, the speech between the pilots and the air traffic controller is basically set to, to zero. There's very, very little. And that is kind of where I come in, where I'm trying to help them and say, in this case, um, it could be helpful and your ears would be free. So we know we're talking that you need to listen to. Um, and so I have made slides. We have made different introductions to that. Um, and I have now some air traffic controllers that they, it's, it's a great idea, like I said, and some of them that really say it's not helpful, Mike. Um, and I have to kind of, in my research, I have to figure out what to do with that um, and how to answer this this question in between. Because as you know, music is always subjective it is always in some form emotional it's always creating some form of reaction on you as a listener and i have to deal with that and i have no idea um sometimes how to really um come up with the final solution or the final saying is is it helpful or not because i think what what it would need would be really like Like imagine if if I bring a new piece to you, yeah, from a new composer, and you would be um, a string player, and I would say this is a new modern piece by any kind of string player um, or by any kind of composer, and so then you also would need to rehearse the piece, and you might say in the very beginning, Mike, the piece is not possible, or I don't like the piece, and then I say, okay, just spend a little time with it, like take yourself. 10 days, 20 days to rehearse, to deal with it. And maybe then after 20 days, you say, no, you know, I love it now because I understand the complexity. I understand how everything is connected. Um, I have it also on my body. I can also play it now. And the problem is the test that we usually are doing is they come in, they still open air traffic controllers, but they come in for the very first time. And then suddenly they have sound. 
it's something very, very strange for them. It's completely new. It's literally unheard for them. Um, and it's in, in many cases, I think, against what they actually would like to. And so that's also the kind of feedback that I'm getting. Some of them are very, very nice. And they say, it's a brilliant idea what you're trying to do. But um, some of the so sounds are literally annoying for me because I'm not used to it yet. I'm, I'm not into it. Um, and that is the biggest problem that I have, that I just don't have enough time to say, let's do this for five days maybe. Yeah, have the system for five days. And then after one week, you can still tell me, I really don't know what to do with these sounds. Or you can say, you know, Mike, now I actually have learned the sounds. I understand them and they actually help me uh, in a way that I did not know before. Because if I just play again, imagine I just play you some sounds, I still need to teach you them, what, what their meaning is. And so even that is something that we're doing. So we give them a kind of um, slides and all of the slides are the sounds. And so they can uh, look at them and they can listen to them so that they have some kind of idea. But, but you know this yourself, you still, it, it needs practice, especially for people that really don't come from this world at all. They come from the visual world. So, so they are visually inclined and thinking about how the aircrafts flying through space and how they can organize them. And suddenly I'm asking sound questions from them. Yeah, it's it's completely, yeah. And so that is the struggle that I have. Um, but it's also very interesting because, I mean, there are just a couple of people at the moment working on these on these ideas. Um and so it's, it's very exciting um, to, to really start thinking about new approaches, new ideas, and what you can do. Uh, interesting. Actually, the theme, what we talk about is not visualization, but sonification. So visualization is nothing else than just make something visual, visible that we didn't see, like data, data from flying aircrafts. And sonification is just, the, let's say, a different thing for the ear. And maybe there's also a, a combination of both, I can I can imagine. And I also have the question you just said, um, German uh, aerospace, it's like NASA. So are there people there thinking about the same? So it, it's a worldwide thing. It's uh, actually international. Are there more people thinking about sonification in 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 that uh, sense? Uh, if you look at sonification, it's 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 a big subject. I mean, I would say for the last forty years, it's growing and growing and growing more and more uh, worldwide. Um, actually, NASA is doing this for a lot of things now. They have their own little team that is doing almost every week. They're sending out some star correlations and then they have some kind of sonification for that uh, sonification is literally used nowadays in almost every field you can think about it from hospitals that have sounds and how they connect to these sounds until cars um, until different kinds of machines and then you can also have this as a research so more and more things are also looked at sonification to see or to listen but better said you um, if you can get more information or at least different kind of information through listening to the sound and also the question of inclusion um, because sonification then can also be used by people that have uh, that are blind or that have um, visual problems. And um, that's that's another thing. But again, I mean, in most of these cases, it's it's still in the baby steps. Yeah, it's it's still they're still trying to explore it. And then, of course, there are the ideas of the um, ultimate uh, sonification tool where you can basically put in every kind of data and it will spit out some kind of sound world that will always be helpful. And then I always say, but how is this actually possible? Because even for visual information, you have so many different diagrams. Yeah, so you're not having one tool that explains everything visually. So why would we even think about trying to do that in in the sonification case um where you always need to think what is the data actually doing and what can you sonify and the other thing that you also said before is, is the combination which i often think is is a little forgotten that i i'm not actually interested with the sonification to get rid of the eye it's quite the opposite um, i'm much more interested of saying um like if you you have data for me for example christoph and you're saying mike here's this data then my first question is uh, what is it that you actually can show easily through the visualization of your data because i don't want to double it what would be the purpose if you have graphs that show for example a heat map where you can say clearly this is very hot and this is very cold 
then why should I show this with the sonification as well? Then I would, for example, much more be interested in asking you, okay, what is something that you can show in that? Hmm. And then add this layer with the sonification rather than just doubling, which is like when you compare it uh, to us film freaks, um, it would be basically paraphrasing. Yeah? Like in a film score, when the music tells the same thing as the visual it does. And I think that is not, for me at least, is not the purpose, but that is often the case in sonification. Right. So when they, for example, show numbers of COVID, then of course it gets very dramatic and high, but I already see that kind of individual information anyway. So I'm often wondering, what is the purpose? Um, another example would be that I was once asked about um, a meteorologist, and, and she told me, you know, I have this weather data, but I don't know what to do with it. Um, and so um, it looks cool and interesting. Um, and I know that there are, uh, we have the cumulus clouds and other clouds. Um, but I can show this visually, but sometimes what is missing is, is the information of how dangerous a cloud is or not. And so I said, well, then let's try a simple experiment. Why don't we highlight just how dangerous a cloud system is or not? And so we just try to make one, two, three or four layers of sound that you kind of can feel what you're seeing emotionally. And that's something that I think is much more for me the purpose of sonification to fill you up with an emotional information that can then actually help you yeah to get deeper into the data um that's so that a, would be that's my a very good point if, if i may add something here um in beginning of july i had the the opportunity to 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 speak on a on a, on a conference and there was also a climate, uh, uh, let's say, a weatherman <laughs> that explained the weather, but it explained the climate change. And with nice visualizations, why nice animations. And I asked the question, what if, and, and, and my point that, that I want to make is just, we don't care. We say, oh, yeah, that's hmm, that's something. Oh, yeah, we don't want that. Or I try to understand what it is. But, you know, it's always somewhere far away on the screen uh, so it doesn't touch me and we in the beginning we had music or sound is a touch from a difference so i thought about hmm, if we would and maybe not everything but parts of it um uh, sonify and would this help to understand us much better that kind of data that was one thought and on the other hand i had a different thought um I was last, um, I did my uh, sound test and I still hear, let's say, around 11,000 hertz. <laughs> and we know that bats, for example, they, 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 yeah, they, they, they talk uh, uh, on much higher. So this means there's a lot of data out there that can be captured with a microphone, but we have to transpose them for three or four or five octaves to make them yeah so that we can listen to them and and i think that maybe if we want would need a different approach in explaining people how severe the climate problem is maybe you should we might should um, invest a little bit more in a, in different senses <laughs> to let them feel and experience what's the effect of of, of that kind of data Mm -hmm. And there's a lot. I mean, if you if you uh, literally put in Google uh, sonification and climate change, I even have a colleague that is doing a ton in in that field. Yeah, so he's doing a lot of commissions for for climate change data to exactly do that. Yeah, because then again, with, with the sound and with the music, you can get an emotional information of the data rather than yeah, rather than just the visual uh, side. But the problem again for me is. Um, the true part of what sonification means for me, which is can it translate some kind of information beyond what you already have is in that case not given because you could then I mean, just go further and say, okay, but we already see this in the graph that the climate is changing. Yeah, so this is a fact. So then again, I'm just doubling something with the music, but maybe then there is something underneath that, for example, you could add the information of how many uh, different animals have died through the climate change. What other impacts does this have? Um, what is the impact on on the water? What is what is the impact on on society in a broader way? So that maybe instead of just showing the climate change as it is, 
that the music can have different aspects. For example, it could show just as a as a very simple example, but um let's say the, the sound of whispering people. Yeah, just imagine the sound of whispering people. And so let's now combine that with climate change. And let's say um, the less climate change, it's probably, it has less impact on people. But then let's make a correlation and say, okay, maybe the whispering will change how the impact of the climate has on people. And so suddenly from a very soft, it becomes, yeah, and so suddenly you have a different information that might be added. It will still be there for, for the purpose of making it um, drastic, maybe, and, and showing the danger of it, but it could be a different aspect. And then you can hear different things coming in and out. Um, and that, I think, is the biggest part of the sonification is that we have these different layers, Yeah, that we have a lot of frequency ranges, even if we, if we have some um, problems on the frequency itself, like you mentioned before, but we can still have the, 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 the big orchestra within there. Yeah? So we can have low stuff, middle stuff, high stuff, and translate the information that way. Nice, very nice. Um, now we, we we talked about um, that sonification. Um, you gave me some files, so we could also, let's say, not talk about, but also let people listen to something. Do you have a suggestion what we should, uh, what we could use? You also at, um, your one of your news newest projects is about uh, gamification, right? Yeah, I think that could, could be a good start. So we we could, for example, start. So the. the um, This was something very, very new for our department um, because they usually think of themselves as, as serious scientists. And so um, the gamification came in by a colleague of mine and he he developed the idea of a game in which you could learn how in the future uh, a human air traffic controller could collaborate with a kind of machine uh, air traffic controller so that is the basic setup yeah so it's yes it's it's also a game but the idea is really that we uh, gain information how people can interact and so it has an ai, AI like chat uh, gpt where you can tell the, the software to do certain things. There's an aircraft flying in, there's an aircraft flying out. And so the very, very basic concept, which makes it also so interesting, is all you have to do is that you basically are an air traffic controller. You're playing as an air traffic controller. And there is an aircraft. And depending on how many aircrafts or aircraft you have still on your plate, the music is changing. Yeah, And so, for example, there is this layer one, which means everything is very nice. So in this, in this layer, it's basically telling you there's all the breaks in it, so everything is still fine. Yeah, so you can relax, um, you're not in a stress position. Um, yeah, there's nothing is really yet dangerous. But so if you go now to the layer three. So you can already hear that the music changed. Um, there's much more beat in it. There, it's much more driven. Uh, there are riding tones that kind of go in and out. Um, and so it's much more alarming. And so that is really the idea, to have different layers. Yeah? And to kind of, even if you can't consciously dissect them, um, we have seen that people actually had this experience that something was more relaxing. Yeah, and that everything was kind of fine. And then the more you kind of lose track, yeah, because that's basically so the so layer three that we just played is when there are too many aircrafts on your mm. table. Yeah. So this means person, you have to really do something now yeah, because otherwise there will be an accident. And so that is one of the things that we are playing within that is to give you an not maybe a visceral experience, but at least an auditory experience of what's going on. So that's really saying man, you have to hurry up. yeah. So you have to, to engage with that. And that's something that, that we have explored here. And then, of course, we have different other sounds that we have. So we have like a um, startup sound that just informs you that the game is starting. Yeah, so it just tells you, um, yeah, 
here here we are we always need especially with 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 electronic stuff to having kind of startup sounds which you know from your computer from other tools is always very helpful because the the more silent stuff mm. gets the more important it is for us to know um can we start now yeah, so you, you know this all from your car. I actually always do that. Um, when I set up my car, sometimes it's still not able or ready to drive. It's just, it's just, yeah, it's just starting. But then when I press the other button, then it makes a deeper, and I know, okay, now I can actually go. And so I'm actually always waiting for the sound, and then I know I can drive. And I think that is also the idea that you always have some form of startup sound or some kind of, of shutdown sounds. Another sound that we had here as well is. Um, when you kind of lose the game, which of course means um, there was an explosion because you have two aircraft flying into each other. I can imagine people play games, they know these kinds of sounds, right? Yeah, so so what I always do, and I think what, what might not be clear for most of the people, so this sound that we just listened to, I composed of seven different layers, uh, which is all, every time um, I work as a sound designer, there's never just, I never just take one sound from someone else and put it in there, but there's even, um, there's explosive sounds, and then there's even a cat growling sound, um, and there are other um, percussive sounds, like metal sounds, and there's even the flatline uh, note tone yeah, that you hear in the very, very end, but basically says, okay, now you're really dead now yeah, with the tone in the very end. Um, and so that's something that I also like to play when, when we develop sound design, that we have these different layers that really create the kick sound or that has um, um, a storytelling ex, um, mm. yeah, a, a element um, that you can really have different parts trailing the story that you really want to do here in that case. I think layering is a principle that's very interesting also in the business world. So when we experience something like complex or complicated, uh, there's always much more going on. There's more dynamics, more more volume than when everything is okay and smooth. And mm -hmm. that, that layering, to understand layering also, let's say in an analogy to, to other things, not only the sound, is, is really interesting. And, and maybe also in the, in the discussion, what would be a different layer and what would the extra layer uh, cause? And maybe some, let's say, some layers that have not so much dynamics when they are played together they might have an have a, a much bigger um, uh, effect mm -hmm. Absol absolutely and that's the same in sound as well um and the other aspect is that what you just mentioned so if I've, if you would for example take an 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 element from 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 this world that you were just describing i would really ask you all the storylines and i would ask you all of these different elements because each layer might be something completely different in my sound world and might be um, a different element that that I might have not even thought about. In the case of this sound, he, the, the colleague of mine literally just said, I, I need something that people really know, okay, now you did something wrong. Yeah? So you really should not uh, enjoy the sound. You should really try to avoid the sound. But yes, that's this is the, the aspect of the layers is something very, very interesting. Yeah? And you can even imagine, which was another pre-experiment that we had, that, for example, give me an example from the business world, something that, that deals with changes of data um, in different elements. I, you mean like drop of, uh, of sales or um, uh, website traffic is, um, is on a certain page where you're not, not expected instead of on another page? Yeah, for example, another colleague of mine is actually literally working on, on that aspects of of traffic, uh, of data traffic on websites. And so, for example, he has created a sonification where you can hear how dangerous a site is. Yeah. So if, if there's less data connected, then you then you have less fluctuation. And if it's more, then of course there's more. And that, that this is the same like even in the other, like when you say financial systems. Yeah, when the, when there is less problem then it could be one layer that is just bubbling there. And then I can add different layers with each step that you are given. Yeah. So that I can, for example, say when nothing is happening, we just have a base and then it makes like a boom da gin da ga or something else. And then with the next layer we we add something percussive. And then with the next layer we add again something else. 
Or we can just say, which is um, which is what we did in this kind of gamification, is that for each layer there is a kind of different composition, but they all based on the same tempo, and yeah. so that you still have this feeling that there's there's a const, um, constant change, but that it's still also connected, and that you don't have harsh breaks between them. That, that resonates a lot with me with the work that that I'm doing in in business, like being a service designer or design thinking, where you make customer journeys. And uh, once I did for for the fun of it uh, with the software of a friend, um, uh, Smaply, um, I I I cut the the Beethoven fifth, <laughs> the score, and put it into that system. Just mm -hmm. show exactly actually what you just said. We have different layers that might be different people or different whatever we call it, and sometimes it makes sense that some stuff is coming together. In, in music would say it's in sync and sometimes it's interesting when it's out of sync out of sync and sometimes it's terrible when it's out of sync and so 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 customer journey and where does the stuff begin where where's the middle part where where does it end is really really interesting and i and, and i think music helps us uh, even music thinking or the understanding of music but if we play it for them so the other way around we get the input from a customer journey and then sonify it and then we get i think the the, the question that you just uh, ask is the question yeah but what does it mean w what is a layer what is not a layer what could mm -hmm. where we think this is one layer but actually there might be two and i think it could help people to understand better let's say to to stick with it their journey if they try to describe how you sonify it because then you have to think about it well how it should sound and if you mm. have that part then you can listen what it means exactly i mean you, you could even if you take basic things like a biofeedback uh, which is where sonification has also been used and let's say let's use here example of the fifth symphony of beethoven so if you just have the da 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 theme yeah um and now you play it and that for example if you just hear it in the nice form then your data is fine yeah let's say financial systems are working and then when something goes off it, then you do what you just said exactly, yeah? So it's getting out of sync. And now, for example, one exercise could be that you're trying to fine tune your data um, that specifically that you're actually getting back on sync. And so you could actually use then the sound that would help you to say, okay, now I'm out of sync with my business and now I'm back in sync. Um, that could be also something where you could use some kind of sonification. Yeah? So that it really would say, um, if my data is not good, then there's chaos or there's there's phrasings of uh, other other forms. When the music is in sync, my business works. That could be a very simple way of using sonification. Oh, I, I even think further now to, uh, because a, a lot of business people use the word orchestration. That's really something where they hang on. Um, did you study music? <laughs> so they, they, they use this. But with orchestration means actually there's an idea and you can play it in different sounds. Mm -hmm. So what if Beethoven fifth wouldn't start with the with the strings, but maybe just with the drum or mm -hmm. or with the trombone or something that sounds different, although everybody would say duh, 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 is oh wow, I know what it is, but it's really something is going on. So and it's still in sync. So there mm -hmm. are many, many possibilities to to translate that. Exactly. Yeah. So that, that's uh, and that's the idea of um, how when I compose these layers, that's exactly what I'm doing. So I would, in in the, again in your your example of Beethoven, I would just take for example have the rhythm, and then I would sync everything, and then each layer could be played at a different moment. But then everything is still in sync, but you can still hear these different layers, and you can hear the orchestration of your business. Um, so that could be, um, yes, a very good way of, of using sonification. Um, another colleague of mine, Ebert Childs, um, he has done a lot of sonification of this kind of financial business stuff. And he also worked uh, in some form with the, the ideas of yeah, orchestrating these sounds for the, for the business world. Um, but then again, what he also experienced is that, and what you also probably know from your world, is that it's not always clear what your client might find helpful. Yeah. yeah, and the sonification. Yeah, so then he also said some clients found this more helpful, some clients. And so again, I don't believe that there is a general tool that 
solves all sonification problems, which I also think would be quite boring because then that would all sound the same. But it's it's um, if you have a customer, then I mean you're you're developing specific things for them as well, yeah. And you're not having your your plan and you're saying, okay, um, I have done this now with ten clients, and you are my eleventh client, and so this is what we're gonna do now. No, you will ask them specifically what is important for you, how do you run your business, what are the connections within your company, and so on and so on. So it's the same with sonification as well. Hmm. Absolutely. Um, I wouldn't think to, um, in the in the example of the customer journey as the client listening, but as the team understanding what the client needs with with different sounds. So I would rather say the the teams have to come up with translations, transpositions, what what means so that they can listen to data instead of looking to data, meaning that actually. And and I think that's we we can segue now also into into BMW in that way. It's an identity how you organize stuff that you say okay this is the way how we visualize it or how we how it sounds, and actually every company could do this in in their way because it's still about data and it's not like um, cl clients sh should uh, should should listen to customer journey, but. In your project, it was the other way around. So you were on the other side, let's say in the car where there is a client that bought, an, uh, for example, a BMW. And uh, how did this work? It was a very interesting experiment. So we started uh, many years ago. Uh, 2010 was the, the beginning of this. And it was very new for BMW because until I came into the department, there was really never a composer. Most of the people that work there were are highly trained and, and awesome, yeah, I'm awesome engineers, psychoacoustic people, psychologists. Yeah, the, the, um, it's just yeah, they, they're great people. Um, but that does not mean always that you have necessarily the right ear to come up with new ideas. Yeah, so they know all of the engineering world. Um, and so that's what was the, the first experiment that we had. What does it actually do if a composer suddenly thinks of the sounds that they would imagine? Yeah. And so in car sounds, you have different forms. Yeah, you have the outside car sounds, yeah, that you hear that the, the car is coming, uh, how fast it usually goes. Um, then you have uh, the sounds of the material. Yeah, which the the material of the, the door and how the door has to sound when you close it and open it, um, and then you have all of the forms of inside sounds. Yeah, that kind of inform you of something, which can be um, your gas tank is soon. Yeah, there's no gas, so you should really hurry up and do something. Um, but it can also be uh, how fast you drive and how you actually drive. Yeah, and so all of that needs to be thought of in new electronic cars. Yeah, because you don't have any of these sounds. So that's and so, when I, also, let's say um, acoustic feedback or yes. let's say functional sounds, and it's a and and there must be a relation to a sound logo because that's part of the identity. Because in the visual world, yeah, we we all know what a logo is, and we all see if there might be, yeah, um, if if my, there if there might be not an original if we see something because in the way how it looks. And this could be translated also to the sound. So you sit in a car, you think, okay, this is not, this is not a BLW. This is what else? Exactly, exactly. And that is uh, that is also what BMW did with me when I came there. We had like several weeks where I was literally touring around the department. I was introduced into what the different models mean, what BMW means, uh, what a Rolls Royce means for them, what is the psychology behind each brand. Um, and then what we did as the next step was. Um, to develop what I call mood compositions, which is not like commercial compositions, is something where um, I developed composition based on the knowledge or the feedback that I received from the team of what yeah, each brand stands for. What does a Mini stand for? What does a Rolls Royce stand for? What does a BMW stand for? And I wrote, in most cases, between 10 to 15 short compositions for each of them. And then, then the team uh, always chooses one. Um, and mm -hmm. so, for example, we can can listen to one back then to the Rolls Royce to the very beginning of that. Okay, here it is.
So, so again, the idea was not to to use this for commercial. It was really back then, which is now quite a while ago. Um, the idea to find an emotional way to express what the brand is. And what is very interesting um, is that in the orchestration, uh, maybe for people that know a little bit more on instruments, there is like a celesta. And celesta was one of the sounds that they have used in, in these older uh, car sounds. Yeah, So it was like harps. What uh, that sounds like if you hit the class. Yeah, uh, like celesta sound or harp sound. So that was like the, the classical sounds. And so I tried to incorporate that because I knew that they would like these kinds of sounds. Um, and then what we would do from this mood composition, we then would figure out uh, like like a broader idea of how I can develop these the sound marks, yeah, the the sounds that would have an information for for the driver. Um, and we did this in in different ways. Um, so, if, if for example, wants to play the the mini, mm different yeah so the the experiment uh, here was to create something lively something quick the idea that i had was the mini driving through different countries and and exploring the world and and figuring things out um and all of these different elements then was that we transformed them into these into these sound marks into these uh, informative sounds that would would say something um and in different forms, like with the with the mini, we also started using the sounds that I had directly from the car, like a driving sound. Even I had um, door closing sounds, so I created different drum sets from that, or I created different pads from the driving sounds, or I used uh, the tone that they had used in the car as as a, a kind of sequencer, and and so on and so on. And then um, after that, I was then hired to develop the the um, sounds for for the new BMW E. And it is, uh, uh, again, it's the electronic car. Yeah. So the idea here was um, that um, I wrote, I think, also 15 different compositions uh, for that piece. I wrote pieces for orchestra. I wrote pieces for strings alone. I wrote a piece that was more like a song. And I always like to include at least one or two pieces where I believe they're completely wrong for the project. Um, the reason why I do this is because I hope that um, either it will tell me something that the client will immediately say, um, I don't like this at all, Mike. Then I know that I have understood what, what I'm doing. Um, or if the client says, I actually really like this. And I know that maybe I missed some information that could be helpful. Because as you know, in the music world, I have basically no limits. Yeah, I, I can do everything from, from a techno track to an orchestral piece. And so it would be a lot of fishing around, or I can end in the dusk. Um, if um, if I don't get this right. And so this is why I'm creating these short compositions that help me also to communicate because not always understand um, our musical language. Sometimes when people say um, make a different tempo, they actually mean dynamics um, or they mean different things. But then if I play them a piece of music, they can just say um, either very simple, I like this or I don't like this. Or Mike, I don't like the instrument that you're using there. It makes this clink clang clung sound. And then I also know, okay, I should not use, for example, a piano sound. Yeah. So from each of these pieces, I get then a direct music feedback that I can use and incorporate in the yeah in the next process of the of the piece. 
That's cool. Here, because you just mentioned they are mood boards or, or, or mood compositions. And maybe that's something, a real big learning. So it's not a product. It's a product in between. It's something that helps us to make decisions later. If you say this is our mood board and later you might have a campaign with a certain music where the agency says, oh, that's cool. People like this at the moment. Okay, that's one part. But the other part is, is this us? Um, or if we would play this, would people think, oh, it's a Nissan or um, um, Volkswagen or, or what else? So that's that's cool with to to create something that actually is not the end product, but it helps you to make the end product better. I like mm -hmm. exactly, exactly. And it's exactly like a mood board. Yeah, so that's really how I would see it. It's just like that's why the reason why I call it mood composition because it's basically from the idea of coming from these mood boards, but in a in a music direction. Um, and then again, I mean, um, it's usually the, so then when I when a client has decided that they like a composition, I create another kind of world of three or four compositions that are influenced by the sound to really just get it right. One very important part here was that in the very beginning, of course, of the electronic cars, I don't know if people remember that, but when the when the BMW E came out, it was this blue and white car. It looked very futuristic and stuff. And so what they said to me for the for the music, um, I need to create something where there's the experience of you basically flying over ground. Yeah. So it, it needs to have this 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 experience. Um, but they also said we want that there's the use of electronic instruments, but we also want to have some well kind of analog or old fashioned instruments. And that's why you could hear in the composition you have both electronic sounds, also sounds that kind of have this feeling of driving, of creating speed, but then there's also the piano. And that is that is um, how all of this information that I received was then triggered into that. And from all of these informations then as you said as well, um I then came up with a completely new system for creating these sound marks. Um, usually, and I think most of the cars that, that your listeners probably have and probably explain uh, or, or probably don't like maybe sometimes um, are pure electronic sounds. Yeah, they, they have beep sounds or they sinus tone sounds, um, usually really thought from an engineering point. And what I did differently back then was that I sampled very highly unusual instruments from weird boom whackers to uh, kalimba instruments to muted guitar sounds. So I really went into creating our own sound library of acoustic sounds, actually not electronic sounds, acoustic sounds. And then I really, as you said also before, I orchestrated them. There is no simple sound that is just beep beep. It's always at least four different layers of sounds working into each other. Um, and then over the, the time of like nine months, I created over nine or three, 400 sounds, I think it was, um, in, in different families, in different directions, with different kind of combinations of sounds until we finally came up with the final sounds, which I can't uh, play here because it's um, a secret for BMW, but I, at least the idea I can... Uh, gif of how we created them yeah for, from the mood compositions the mood boards to the different sounds um but each step always had then the engineering team behind it and of course because in the electronic car when it came out 10 years ago um there were also new informations that we needed to translate. So there were there was a startup sound that we did that BMW didn't have to do before, or there was a shutdown sound, and so we had to create all the uh, new sound systems. And so for them, I usually then really create like a like a book um, of how the sounds should be created. Um, because otherwise, if you, for example, let's say you create a, a time machine, yeah, you come to me and say, Mike, I've created a time machine, and for certain buttons, I need a sound. So every time. Um, you have put in the date uh, for the time travel. I need a specific sound. And every time uh, the, the system has a broken problem, then I need another sound. Um, and so in order for us to, to get better at this, I create like... Um, in information of how you liked certain sounds. For example, if you say uh, when the sound, uh, when the data is put in, I like that the sound goes up. And then I, for example, notated it. Okay, here's always an up sound or an, an arpeggio sound that helps us in the future that we don't always need to start from scratch. Yeah, so that I know when I, even if I create the tens different version, I will never make it beam bomb because I know this is something that you didn't like. 
Um, and so that is also something that I think might be in your world similar, that you need to create a certain system where at some point, you know, um, the, this business side will always be in the same way, but I can maybe influence it in some in-between stuff, but it will always have yeah, this kind of triangle or whatever. I don't know you all so good. So um, to, to to pick on that part, uh, like uh, giving feedback or, or or helping, actually helping to do your job better. Let's say helping to be a better elect, uh, uh, e-driver. And I know this from uh, from all the the testings, the website testing, the testing of new uh, visual identity. Um, I knew one thing. When people don't talk about the design and just finish their de their their task, then we have good design. And if they talk about, oh, I like this or I like that, then we already knew, oh, now they, now they it looks like they have a problem to do their task. So so the the visuals or the identity should help you to do where you came from. And I like that link uh, to, to, to the car. It's not about the beeps and the boops. It's about like getting from A to B as safe as possible and, mm. as, and as nice as possible. Was there also a relation to, then, then let's look to the, to the commercials, to, to the sound logo of BMW or, or, or Mini? Uh, the, the the sound branding or the audio branding is always done by different companies. So that's something that we did not even touch. Um, it was really mostly um, the, the interest of coming up with new systems, yeah, and um, thinking about new ways. And I mean, the, the connection of even just connecting acoustic and electronic sounds was something that was unheard of over 10 years ago yeah so mm -hmm. again this is not what we're talking about it's not now but that's really how i started yeah. to develop these these new sound systems and i still sometimes and maybe it's just my stupid arrogant mind but i still believe that some of the sounds that we created because they were so unusual we can find them also now in, in some other cars i sometimes hear them um because yeah like kalimba is like an african instrument yeah so that was highly unusual for um, a german company to have even that sound uh, inside their kind of sound systems but now i can hear sometimes that also other uh, audio using these kind of more asian influenced sounds so maybe it was just an accident maybe i'm just thinking too much about it but yes yeah, so that was really different at, at mm. this point um i think that's a good point because you know if we I don't have a kalimba now uh, here as a sound example. Uh, both of us, we know what a kalimba is. I imagine that a lot of people don't know what it is, but if they hear the sound, they have an association with it. So, and maybe it's a sound that is clear for, for, for that task uh, to, to do. So maybe sometimes you have to get rid of all the, 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 the links that, that we know and think about, okay, but what, how does it sound? Does it do the job where, uh, where it's used for? So, and for example, um, th that would be my kind of understanding that it's maybe good sound for that certain, certain thing that maybe also should be in some way the same in all the cars it it's like if every car would sound totally different and then i mean from um from the acoustic feedback so that when i yeah maybe not the start and the stop sound maybe that's something different but all the other sounds like oh um, problems or um, uh, you're too close to another vehicle or what else if this would be with every car a totally different sound it wouldn't make it also hard to switch cars for example uh, but still, the companies really want that. Yeah? I mean, the, the companies, like particularly BMW, wants to sound different. Yeah, So they want uh, a different experience. But I am with you. I mean, the, the question could be, um, I mean, in, and then the distance sound would be uh, something that I think is recognizable every in every car. Yeah, So that you have the beep, 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 beep sound, yeah? or the, that you have to turn, take a left turn or a right turn. Yeah, um, I think these are similar. But overall, I think the companies really want to sound differently and i think um a bmw experience really is something different than a ford big golf experience um mm -hmm. at least i would say that um but again i mean the, the the whole thing that i wanted to to say here is just that um the the combination of the sounds that we used back then was really new and 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 different um and open, I think, the, the doors to really what then I think Hans Zimmer um, also changed now that when he came in and worked there as well, which, of course, he's much more famous than me. That's not a question. But um, he he 
be brought in this different sense as well. And I would um, also say, I mean, that that me working at BMW and showing that a composer is helpful in thinking about the acoustic world maybe changed all the, the, the thinking in the engineering uh, system, yeah. So that they realize we are great people. We know really they they know everything there is to know about cars and and car acoustics and stuff. But maybe it's a great way to incorporate artists and scientists to actually make the sound even better. And then maybe to say, okay, I have this and this idea. How can you incorporate this scientifically or engineering wise? Absolutely, and and, uh, and explore these different thoughts. I think that's a very good point because then um, in, it's not the black and white thinking. It's not here are the engineers and, and the car is good, and here are the artists or design where I say, but it's be- but this is beautiful. It had it has, it has to be both, and as long as these two worlds or maybe there it's maybe a la- also a layered world. There are not only two, maybe seven, two even more layers. If they don't make decisions to really make one special combination of layer um it will it will not work it will uh, yeah so i think that's a very very good point all right um we already time wise quite far so that was really really interesting to to dive with you into the sonification and also in acoustic feedback and 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 all these uh, yeah all these decisions and possibilities that you can do with let's say musical parameters to to describe the real world or or other worlds or even future worlds um what's the project where you're working uh, working on now well, we're still working on a lot of uh, sonification and air traffic control, but we also have very interesting projects with the University of Augsburg with Professor Sonne Metzner, where we're working on the more effect of music and how it can be used in kind of music therapy. We're working on projects there to help patients with delia. Uh, we also hope to work um, on a new way to help uh, breathing, um, to to yeah, to kind of focus breathing in different forms. Then we have uh, sonification of language projects. Um, then we also have very interesting projects with the SETI Institute, where I'm artist and resident. We're working on a project called Imagine Aliens, uh, which is um, a project that we will develop over the next year, where we will create an app uh, where people can learn about how to create planets and what life on planets might mean. And for all of these different scenarios, I will create a complex orchestral score that basically every time you create your own world, depending on the the scientific knowledge that you're creating, um, there will be a different kind of orchestral texture that comes with that um that's another project that we're working on and then we have um other projects um, sounds awesome by the way so (laughs) yeah i'm very excited about that as well yes um, in in the vacation i i read the new book from i don't know if you know her annalee newitz it's terraformers Mm -hmm. Um, it's speculative fiction and it plays in fifty nine thousand. So, ah. and, and that's interesting because if it would play only in 100 years or 200 years or 300, maybe in 600 years, so we would always say, oh, yeah, but hang on, how does this work? So, but if you, and that's nice in, in a projection like this, if you project it really so far, and you say, okay, then everything is possible or maybe nothing is possible, and you create new worlds, and then, uh, and we assume we still have something like eyes and something like ears and we can feel uh, that's interesting to think about and to realize. And that's the nice thing with design. You can create it and then you can listen about it. And then you can think about what can you learn for everything that we're doing here. Exactly. And that's the idea behind Imagine Aliens is to learn how planets work, but then also how, how the impact is on our own planet. So that's really the, the correlation of that. And I mean, if you like, then we can uh, just as a, as a sent home way, we could play um, a snippet from Reshape, which is another project we just finished with uh, two really outstanding mathematicians in Luxembourg, which was called Reshape, where we sonified the world of curves. 
All right. So, but then let's do it this way. Then I would thank you very much, Mike. <laughs> and then we end with music, which we never do, which I never do. So that's a, that's a, a, a first one. Thank you very much for sharing all these, um, yeah, these super interesting uh, details and also for, yeah, like companies like mini BMW and uh, German aerospace. Thank you very much for, yeah, for sharing all these. I very much enjoyed talking to you. So thank you very much for your time.
thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate this because listening is one of the top leadership skills and I feel honored about this. It is my mission to find, create and share inspirations for meaningful collaboration based on music analogies. If you want to support this, please subscribe to the podcast, give us a rating or write a review on iTunes or Spotify. And more inspirations can be found on musicthinking.com. We have a blog and you can download the Music Thinking Framework. And finally, I would love to hear your feedback. And if you need help with a business challenge, please reach out to me via email podcast at musicthinking.com. <laughs>